Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to the Oxford Union's next event in this Smashing the Silos series that comes originally from trying to answer the question, what is it that universities should be teaching people but currently aren't? Um, today, it's all about artificial intelligence and interdisciplinarity, and I'd like to ask Shauna Higgerty, who will be chairing this session, um, to introduce today's guests and to say thank you very much, Sean, for all your help with putting all of this together. Thank you so much, James, and thank you all for joining us for the second session in this Interdisciplinarity in AI event, which is part of the Smashing the Silos series. This morning, we had a fascinating session thinking about the nature of artificial intelligence, what we can learn by bringing in insights from across cognitive science, philosophy of mind, neuroscience, and of course, computer science. And towards the end of that discussion, um, questions started being raised about what do we need to be thinking about on a societal level? What do policymakers need to understand around artificial intelligence? And quite conveniently, that leads us very nicely into the second session of the day, which is going to be grappling with exactly these issues. Uh, we have uh, two wonderful speakers um, with us today. Professor Sandra Wachter is Associate Professor and Senior Research Fellow focusing on the law and ethics of artificial intelligence big data and robotics at the Oxford Internet Institute. She's a policy advisor for governments, companies and NGOs around the world. And she'll be speaking about algorithmic fairness and why it cannot be automated. She'll be followed by um, Dr. Karina Prunkel. Oh, I should mention um, Sandra is with the Oxford Internet Institute, one of the leading centers in the UK working on these issues. Um, Sandra will be followed by Dr. Karina Prunkel, who is a research fellow at um, Oxford's new Institute for Ethics in AI, which was established um, with much fanfare last year. And Karina focuses on the ethics of autonomous systems and teaches as well on the governance of AI. And so she'll be speaking about um, the challenges of staying in charge, human autonomy and artificial intelligence. These are two of the really big um, questions when it comes to the societal impacts of AI, and it's a real privilege to have these speakers with us today. After the talks, um, we will have a discussion where if you're in the audience and you want to raise questions, please put them into the Q&A and we will hope to address some of these. Um, just to remind you, we'll have one more session at the end of the day on intercultural um, perspectives on AI. And if you're interested in that topic, please do remember to register in advance. But at this point, um, do let me hand over to Professor Sandra Wachter. Thank you so much for, for the introductions. Um, I have prepared some slides that I would like to um, share with you. Okay, if everything is fine, you should be seeing the slides now. Yes, I see not. Fantastic. Um, yes, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity today to talk to you about actually my, my latest work um, that went live only two days ago. Um, this is an interdisciplinary paper, uh, which is called Bias Preservation and Machine Learning, the Legality of Fairness Metrics under European Non-Discrimination Law. And I wrote this together with um, two of my colleagues, Brent Middlestead, who is also here at the University of Oxford at the Oxford Inter Institute. He's an ethicist by training. And um, then there is Chris Russell, who is a machine learning expert. And I myself was also at the Oxford Inter Institute. I'm a lawyer. So the three of us were working together on that project try to figure out what fairness means in law and computer science. So to start us off, I would like to give you an overview of the things I would like to discuss to, um, today. I would like to take the opportunity to talk a little bit about what fairness means in the law. Then I will talk about what fairness actually means in computer science. And lastly, I will show how both those notions are currently clashing. Before I do that, I would actually like to share the findings of my paper first and then use the rest of the time to show you how I arrived at my conclusion. So in my opinion, uh, we are currently standing at a very important crossroad where we have three options in front of us when it comes to automated decision-making bias and fairness. The one thing that we could do is do nothing and just wait. And that would mean that existing inequalities in our world will exacerbate. The second option that we have ahead of us is try to fix the technology and try to make sure that things are not getting worse as they currently are. And the third option that we have ahead of us is to try to use technology to shed light on existing inequalities and use that as somewhat as a starting point to erode inequalities in our lives. So those are the three options and I'm going to tell you how I arrived at this conclusion. Um, in order to do that, it actually makes a lot of sense to talk about bias uh, for a little bit and try to figure out what I mean by that. 
I think roughly you can um, distinguish between two types of biases, technical and societal bias. So technical bias means that the trouble stems from the technology in itself. One example would be facial recognition software. We do know that those classifiers are less accurate for women and people of color. Why is that the case? Because they have predominantly trained on white faces. So the classifier is not able to read them accurately. And that then leads to unfair outcomes in the real world, technical bias. On the other hand, we have societal bias. That means the trouble actually stems from a human making certain decisions. And those biased decisions then flavor the data and the decisions that are being fed into the algorithm and then disadvantage certain groups in our society. So for example, if somebody is deciding that you're not getting a job because of a disability, then this will be fed into the algorithm. The algorithm will learn that and then will reject people with disabilities at higher rates. Of course, those distinctions are not perfectly clean because one informs the other, obviously, because there is a reason as to why um, we made the design choice to only predominantly use white faces to train the classifier. Um, but I think the distinction is still very helpful because it shows you what people are currently focusing on when they try to fix things. Are they trying to fix society or are they trying to fix technology? So let's look at the law and let's ask ourselves the question, what is it that the law wants to fix? And it's very clear that the law is about fixing society and making the world a fairer place. But what does fairness actually mean? Um, a very long discussion has you know, always had in our society. Um, the law thinks that everybody is equal. And this goes back to Aristotle, obviously, that said, he said, uh, you should treat like cases alike and unlike cases differently. But the question is, what does equal treatment actually mean? And to talk about this, I actually want to go back to a very personal story of myself. Um, it's a very interesting story that I heard when I was six or seven years old, when I was still um, in elementary school. We read, a, we read a piece that was called The Wise Judge. The Wise Judge was centered around a story where two siblings, a brother and a sister, were fighting over a delicious piece of cake. And they could not decide how to divide up that cake. And they go to a judge and ask the judge, how should we do this so everybody gets an equal and fair um, share? And the wise judge said that the brother should be the one that cuts up the cake and the sister is the one that gets to choose first. And I remember when I read this as a kid, I thought what an elegant way to make a fair decision, a bulletproof decision to make sure that everybody gets an equal share. And I thought if a discipline is able to create something that is so elegant and fair, I wanna be part of it. And actually, I think most of us would agree that it's a very simple way to make sure that equality is served. So, but what if I told you that the sister hasn't eaten in three weeks? Would you still think that the equal shares are fair. And that is exactly the conundrum that we face in European non-discrimination law. We have roughly two types of concepts. We have formal equality and we have substantive equality. Formal equality means I'm closing my eyes, I'm trying to treat everybody equally. Everybody gets the same piece of cake, the same um, size of cake. And then you have substantive equality, which is divided into equal opportunity and equality of results. So equal opportunity means, for example, that you're not closing the eyes um, between the differences of group. You acknowledge that certain groups are more hungry than others, and therefore they distribute cake differently. A more radical approach to that would, for example, be equality of results, where you don't care so much about the process, but you care about the outcome. So for example, regulation, in Northern Ireland that said that um, in police stations there have to be a 50-50 split of Protestants and Catholics because of the historical um, disadvantages that happened in the past. So this is the idea of formal equality and substantive equality, the concepts. Those two ideas actually found their way into non-discrimination law um, in the way of direct discrimination and indirect discrimination. 
So direct discrimination, which is very akin to formal discrimination, uh, formal equality, means that you should not be treated less favorably based on a protected attribute that you possess. That means if I'm selling, you're not getting the job because you're a woman or because of your ethnicity or because of your sexual orientation, this will be illegal in, in most cases. You try to treat everybody equally, the same, just like Aristotle wanted. On the other hand, you have indirect discrimination, which is much subtler. Indirect discrimination means that you are using a seemingly neutral provision criterion or practice, applying it to everybody equally, and it just so happens that it poses a particular disadvantage on a certain group when compared with others in a similar situation. So that means, for example, if I'm hiring for a job and I'm saying I'm only going to hire people that are taller than two meters, this could be an idea of indirect discrimination. Height is not a protected attribute, but you will understand that having a height requirement will at least disfavor women. And that's the difference. The difference between indirect and direct discrimination is that indirect discrimination wants to acknowledge the hurdles and the structures and the factual differences between group. Um, this concept was created to actively dismantle in society. It's seen as a diagnosis tool where inequality occurs and should give you a map of where further social engineering has to happen. That means if the outcome isn't the same for everybody, then it means there is something wrong with the system. And if that's the case, then this system ought to be justified. So what you can say is that the, the goal of non-discrimination law is really substantive equality. But the question is, what does that actually mean? Obviously, there are very theories around that, but roughly it means it is ac about actively trying to dismantle inequality. It is about redistributing resources, making sure that all people have access to social goods. Um, it's about promoting diversity, it's about social inclusion, being part of a community, about solidarity. So just closing your eyes and treating everybody equally is not um, the goal of discrimination law. It's really about um, de facto equality, substantive equality. So this is what the law wants to do. The law wants you to actively take part to make the world a fairer place. So let's talk about what computer science has to say about this and how computer science thinks about fairness. It will come as no surprise that most of what computer science focuses on is on trying to fix the technology, which makes sense, that's their discipline. So let's have a look at how computer sciences are currently doing this um, at the moment. What they're trying to do very often is to try to create bias tests to figure out if bias is actually occurring. The way they're doing this is they very often use what is called conditional independence. This means they're trying to make sure that the decision-making system that they're using and the target variable is independent from a protected attribute and a conditional um, variable. So what does it mean? I'm trying to make sure that my target variable, if somebody should get a loan, and the conditional attribute, for example, salary, that both of those are independent from race, gender, sexual orientation. That makes sense. Based on this classification, conditional, uh, conditional independence, we have come up with a classification system of various bias metrics, the ones that are bias preserving and the ones that are bias transforming. Bias preserving fairness metrics mean that you have an explicit dependence on the target variable. What does that mean? It means if I want to decide if somebody should get a loan, the target variable, I also condition on the target variable, so past loan decisions, and I want to make sure that those are not depending on race and gender and so on. So what you try to do is you asking if prior candidates that look like the current candidates have repaired the loan in the past. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to match error rates across the groups. So what you're trying to do is to look at the false positives and false negatives and making sure that you are making the same mistakes at the same rate. So in other words, you're trying to preserve error rates. You're trying to make sure you're not making things worse. Therefore, you're trying to preserve the bias. The other thing that you could do is you can use a so-called bias transforming metrics. That means you also condition on something, but it's not the target variable. It could be something very different. The main differences between those types of uh, bias tests is that the bias 
um, transforming metrics usually look at decision rates. They look at the uh, distribution of outcomes between groups, whereas bias preserving metrics, they try to match the error rates between the groups. So let's go back to bias preserving metrics, those who match the error rates across the groups. At first look, it looks actually quite fair because what is it that you're doing? You look at past loan decisions and you're asking yourself if something somebody similar um, is applying for a loan and a similar applicant was able to repair it as well, then you can assume that this candidate will be successful as well. You look at past university admissions and you look at past candidates that look like the current candidate. And if past candidates did well, you admit them to a university. You do the same um, for jobs and insurance. So what you're trying to do is you look at your past data and um, talk about ground truth because you have some data of how well people did in the past. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to justify the future with the past. You're trying to use the status quo as a neutral starting point to make decisions. But the problem is the status quo is not neutral at all. And I want to give you one example of that in the paper. We have a series of those, but I only have time for one here. So let's talk about grades. Um, I think most of us will agree that grades can have a very subjective element to it. But what about math grades, for example? Like two and two is four. There is so-called ground truth. So if I'm deciding that I'm giving out fellowships, for example, based on math grades, this could be seen as a very fair metric, couldn't it? Well, the thing that you might not know is that there is interesting research, for example, that shows that in the US, um, middle and high school teachers perform um, the mathematical skills of boys more favorable than girls, and they give them better grades on average. They also offer more mentorship to boys and encourage them much more to take up STEM subjects in the future. And this type of bias continues then actually at university where on average male peers rank female performance less than uh, equivalent male performance. The same bias uh, can then be found in the job market where interesting research shows if you send two batches of identical CVs out to job advertisements and the one batch has male names on it and the other batch has female names on it, you will find that both male and female assessors rank female qualities less than male qualities, offer them a lower salary and give them less promotions. This type of bias is also reflected in reference letters, for example, where women are often being described as team players and hardworking. Men are often described as trailblazers or geniuses. And the problem is that this type of gender bias is baked into our brains very early on. Interesting research shows that by the age of six, children, if you show them pictures of boys doing cooking and sewing, they misremember seeing a girl. And here's the problem. AI does not know about this. AI does not know about the social story between the data points. And actually, we often don't know about those stories either. And now think about how often your grades and your reference letters and your salaries have opened opportunities for you. Think about how often grades determine whether you get to go to a certain school or get a job or a fellowship and how often reference letters decided if you get, for example, a loan or a job and how often we use promotions and high salaries as a metric of success. But those types of data are not unbiased and the status quo is not neutral. And this is exactly where the law and computer science start to clash. So let's go back to the underlying assumptions um, according to the bias metrics in computer science. You have the bias preserving metrics that are trying to match the error rates. They basically say, I'm happy as long as things don't get worse, as long as the status quo is being preserved. And then you have bias transforming metrics who are trying to match decision rates. And they say, I'm only happy if equal outcome has occurred across groups. That means one type of bias metrics is happy with keeping things as they are. And the other one is only happy if equal access has actually occurred. And based on that, we came up with an argument in relation to non-discrimination law. Um, 
because what you can say is that if you're trying to use bias preserving metrics, trying to match the error rates, this is much more akin to formal equality, which is equal treatment, treating everybody the same without changing the underlying system, whereas bias transforming metrics that are much more about trying to match decision rates and outcomes is much more akin to substantive equality, the idea of changing things. So if we now go back to what the aim and the purpose of the law is, it is substantive equality. It is about eroding inequality and about dismantling disparity and are trying to achieve parity and inclusion and keeping things as they are is simply not good enough under European non-discrimination law. And since most of those bias metrics use the unneutral status quo as a starting point to make decisions and freeze the status quo, this is an actual problem. So what we are arguing is that if you're using bias transforming metrics in a sector that is known to have certain biases, for example, hiring, the fact that you're using bias preserving metrics raises um, prima facie discrimination. That means it looks like you are on the face discriminating against people. And that means you uh, need to justify this from a legal perspective. Of course, if you're using bias transforming metrics, this does not mean that you're out of the woods automatically. If you're using bias transforming metrics um, and you see disparity as the outcome, you still need to justify this as well. But the advantage is that bias transforming metrics do not assume that the status quo is neutral um, because they're only going to be satisfied if the outcome is actually equal across groups. To take it a bit further and talk about substantive equality here for a bit, um, the underlying assumptions are actually quite important and show how they are in conflict. Um, because when you use bias transforming metrics, the reasons for decision making don't play a role at all. And that's pretty problematic. So it doesn't matter why somebody didn't get a loan. Um, this could be because, for example, didn't get a job. This could be because they were black or because they didn't have a PhD. This fairness metric doesn't care about why rejection actually happened. So you actually don't know whether you have ground truth and whether it was the right decision. The second problem is you pretending to have ground truth, but you actually don't because you have no access to the counterfactual world of what would have happened. You only have data of the people who were admitted to university, who did get the loan and who did get insurance. You don't have any data of those people that have been rejected. So you don't actually have ground truth and basing decisions on that can be problematic. Of course, what you can do is use a proxy to estimate what would have happened. So you can use, for example, credit scores to figure out if somebody might repair a loan in the future, or you can try to predict if somebody will be arrested to assume if they will break the law. But the mismatch between the thing you want to predict and the proxy that you're using for it is actually quite problematic. And those proxies are very prone to bias because they're replicating the status quo. And lastly, conditioning on a neutral status quo completely overestimates the role of meritocracy in our society. It ignores things like inheritance and luck, unequal opportunity and discrimination. For example, in the US, 40% of children that were born into the lowest um, income group remain there for the rest of their lives, 30% in the UK. 2020, an OECD study um, was published that showed the limits of social mobility. It takes six generations in Germany to move from the lowest income bracket to an average income bracket. It takes five generations in the US, in Switzerland, Austria, and three generations in Sweden. And we have to keep that in mind. After all of this, a very you know logical question would be to ask, OK, how often how prevalent are bias preserving metrics in the fairness literature. So what we did is we looked at um, the fairness metrics that currently exist. There are 20 of them that we analyzed. 13 out of 20 are bias preserving metrics. 13 out of 20 are focusing on the status quo as a neutral starting point. So two thirds of it actually freeze the status quo. 
This is not to say that you cannot use bias preserving metrics. There are still um, ideas where you can use them, for example, for testing or for diagnosis or research purposes. And in a situation where you do have ground truth um, or where there is no bias or where the bias is actually justified or in jurisdictions where uh, only formal equality is pursued. But what we are arguing, if you're making decision in a sector that is marked by inequality and protected under European law, the fact that you're making a choice to use a bias preserving metrics causes prima facie discrimination suspicion and needs to be justified. In short, whenever you're making a choice of choosing a fairness metrics, you need to make, you need to be aware that you're making an explicit decision on whether or not the status quo is acceptable or not. So after all of this, the question is fine. Substantive equality wants to erode um, inequality, but who should be doing this? So who has any duties to do so? And that's an, an interesting question. We don't really know. Um, it's very clear that the law sees an active and passive role for both the private and the public sector. However, it's not really clear what that duties actually look like. Some say there's a preemptive duty. Others say, no, only if you feel like that inequality might occur, then you ought to do something. Others say, no, you only have to act once a complaint is actually lodged. Others say, our oh, complaint systems are nonsense anyway, because we should not rely on people actually fighting for this litigation. So what's very clear is that both the public and the private sector have an active role and duty to dismantle inequality, but it's not quite clear what that role actually looks like and further research needs to focus on it. But let's just say you are on board with it and you feel, yes, you want to take your role um, seriously. The question is, what kind of metrics should you be choosing? So what would be the right choice of fairness metrics? Um, last year in 2020, we wrote a paper which is called Why Fairness Cannot Be Automated, Bridging the Gap Between EU Non-Discrimination Law and EI, again with the same authors, Brent Middlestead and Chris Russell. And what we try to do is look at the case law of the European Court of Justice and figure out what fairness actually means from a legal perspective. And then we try to figure out if that concept of fairness has an equivalent in computer science, and it does. Um, so, and this test is called conditional demographic um, disparity. This particular test is very good for detecting um, heterogeneous um, discrimination, minority-based into uh, minority-based discrimination, intersectional discrimination. And what we suggested in that paper is that developers or the public and the private sector publish the summary statistics of the tests that they did and the conditioned variables that they used, because that type of transparency will enable us to have a very open discussion on what type of disparity is acceptable in a society. So for example, if I'm saying I'm conditioning on salaries when giving out loans, you can have a, start to have a dialogue around A, is it fair to use salaries um, as a deciding factor whether somebody should get a loan, even though there's income inequality. Or you could say, B, yes, there's income inequality, but it's justified to do so because giving people loans that they're not gonna be able to repair will indebt them further. Or you can have C, a more um, nuanced discussion around whether or not maybe there are other variables that you can use that are less discriminatory, but just as effective in assessing credit worthiness. So having that type of dialogue is exactly what we are after. We want a civil dialogue between consumers and regulators and industry to figure out what kind of disparity is societal acceptance, accepted. And if you did that, we think that this shows an actual commitment to substantive equality because it shows that you're reflecting on those issues openly. So, conclusion. Um, as I said, I think we are currently at the crossroads where we have to make a decision of how we want to proceed. We can either do nothing, as I said, and let's get things out of hand and make things worse. Or we can do what most of what happened thus far is trying to fix the technology and keeping things as they are, preventing things from getting worse, or, and that's my ob obvious favorite, is trying to use technology um, to shed light on existing inequalities and start as a, using as a starting point to make 
the world a better place. Um, the main argument of the paper, just to reiterate, is that it's very important for us to acknowledge that the status quo is not neutral. We need to acknowledge that widespread and diverse inequality is a fact that needs to be disproven. And it's very clear that Europe agrees with that because substantive equality is the declared aim of non-discrimination law. Keeping things as they are is not good enough. And similarly, choosing a fairness metrics is not a neutral act at all. As I said, we have two types of bias tests, the classification system that we came up with, the one bias preserving that uses the status quo as a neutral starting point and bias transforming that actually acknowledges that some groups are worse off. And this is the important thing that I want people to take away with. If you're using bias preserving metrics in a sector that is marked by inequality, then you need to justify it. Very important to keep in mind, choosing a fairness metrics is not a neutral act. By choosing a fairness metrics, you're making an explicit decision on whether or not the status quo is acceptable or not. However, as I said, bias preservation, um, the paper is also called like that, has still a role to play in our society. And because it is very complicated and you have to combine philosophy and law and computer science, we came up with a checklist that hopefully will help developers to find, to navigate through that jungle and find the most appropriate um, fairness metric for whatever purpose that they're actually using. So we hope that this will give some guidance here. Our preference for um, ideas around non-discrimination and European purposes is, as I said in the, the other paper that we wrote, um, to use conditional demographic disparity because it is the most akin to what the court of justice thinks is fair. If you actually publish the, the, the results of those bias tests and the variables that you condition on, you will allow a public dialogue around what's actually fair and what it's not. It's also very excited. I'm very excited to share that the paper um, where fairness cannot be automated and the test that we developed in that paper, the whole work was recently implemented by Amazon in December 2020. So what they have done is they implemented conditional demographic disparity, our test in SageMaker Clarify, which is their bias testing toolkit, which is now available for all customers of uh, Amazon Web Services. So that's actually quite exciting to see that now everybody can go in and try to figure out if their algorithms are actually biased. Very exciting. So how do I see the way forward? Um, I think it's very important that we acknowledge that technology will not alone will not fix society. It's also very important that we need to acknowledge that more data is not the answer alone. What we actually will need is a commitment for social change. And that is what I hope we will do. I hope we use uh, forms of bias testing like bias transformation and CDD as a tool for active social um, change. Because if you did that, and if you publish summary statistics and the conditions, then you will show um, what you're actually doing behind closed doors. Um, you can have an informed decision whether it's okay to use income and PhDs to make decisions about people. You invite a public dialogue on what type of disparity is acceptable in our society and which is not. And that's exactly the next step that needs to happen. We need to have an open and inclusive society, a discussion around what type of society we want to live in. And we must not allow technology to freeze the status quo because we will not never achieve social equality if we settle for the status quo. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sandra, for an absolutely wonderful talk. We already have a couple of very good questions, but just to remind um, those of you in the audience, we're going to do a combined Q&A and panel discussion after our second talk. But just to say that um, I found it really compelling the way that um, you um, presented these issues of um, bias preservation versus bias transformation. Um, as somebody from a more scientific background, it's very intuitive and perhaps even seductive to think that if you have a system that basically um, analyzes the data that you give it and that that is going to be by default a very objective and fair system. But uh, I think it's exactly these kind of broader perspectives from different disciplines that can show the limitations of that way of looking at things. So um, I think that this is a really important piece of work. Uh, now, 
Before we go to the um, discussion, I'd like to um, pass over to our second speaker of the session, uh, Dr. Um, Karina Prunkel from the Institute for Ethics in AI, who's going to be talking about control, human autonomy, and um, yeah, how we stay in control. Over to you, Karina. Um, right, yes, so I hope you'll all be seeing my, my screen now. Well, first of all, thank you so much for the, uh, for, to the organizers for creating this really wonderful event series. My name is Karina Prunkel, and I'm a research fellow at Oxford's newly founded Institute for Ethics in AI. So our goal at the center is to promote AI ethics globally as a field that really is comparable to medical ethics and that not only draws on Oxford's very long philosophical tradition, but that also brings in researchers from a wide number of different disciplines, including computer science, law, and political science. So um, yes, smashing the silos is really uh, the, right, uh, the, the right approach, I find. So today I'm talking about human autonomy and artificial intelligence. And by now, AI systems really are being deployed across an enormous range of different sectors. So here's an overview given by Matt Tork over the 2020 data and AI landscape. And you can see how there is, there's actually so much going on already that it's difficult to get this onto one slide. So I've been updating this uh, AI uh, data and data and AI landscape um, over the last few years. And by now it really, it really is, is getting too, uh, too big to put onto, onto one slide. So here on the right-hand side, uh, we see applications by industry. And you can see how this really ranges. AI applications really range um, from healthcare, transport, education, advertisement, finance, and real estate. So we see how AI development is beginning to really penetrate a lot of sectors in our society. Um, so let me give you some more concrete examples to illustrate this point. So we have facial recognition technology um, that now allows automatic identification of individuals on the basis of facial features. And uh, we know, I mean, that's not only used for the online tagging of pictures, but it's already being used for policing and of course for commercial targeting. For those of you who live in Oxford, uh, you might have already seen the self-driving self -driving cars. Uh, so Oxbotica's cars uh, are driving on Oxford streets, uh, testing their autonomous vehicle software. Uh, big firms, we, we see in, uh, with big firms, we see an increasing use of AI-driven recruitment software. So some of which involve the creation of personality profiles for job applicants uh, on the basis of their interview performance. And as you can see from the image here on the bottom left, uh, such software sometimes is not working exactly as intended. So here a picture was edited into, so the, the picture frame and um, with a photo was edited into a candidate's video and the software in turn created a very different personality profile of the candidate. And then finally, AI systems are increasingly present in our home environments. So that's traditionally a very intimate environment. We have where we have uh, virtual personal assistants such as Alexa and intelligent heating and lighting systems that learn about our, our habits and that adapt their behavior accordingly to decide when um, say heating is required. So now as we're delegating more and more tasks to AI systems, this raises the question as to how this outsourcing of various decisions affects actually our own ability to make decisions. Or in other words, it raises the questions about how AI may impact human autonomy. So here two colleagues from Oxford have phrased this problem in the following way. So Floridi and Cowles write, the risk is that the growth in artificial autonomy may undermine the flourishing of human autonomy. Now that there is a serious concern about the effects of AI on human autonomy has also been recognized across the board. So there are a lot of um, governmental and international guidelines on the responsible development of AI. And many of them, if not, if not even most of them, stress the importance of AI systems to be developed so as to protect human autonomy or even to facilitate human autonomy. So that's even more. Um, a more positive step. So in today's talk, um, I want to illuminate 
the concerns about AI and human autonomy in a bit more detail and show how, how tracking them actually will require an extensive collaboration between various disciplines uh, and between various sectors. So I begin by discussing what exactly we're concerned about. So what do we actually mean by human autonomy and why, why is it important for us to protect it? I then talk about the potential effects of AI on human autonomy, and then finally discuss how we can ensure that these effects end up being net positive. So when we talk about human autonomy very broadly, uh, we understand by autonomy the effective capacity of people to make decisions of their own that are of practical import to their lives. Now, there are different, different ways one can read such a statement or such a definition. So on the one hand, we may focus on the fact that the decisions are people's own decisions. So they're in some important sense authentic to the person who makes the decision or who holds the values or who has certain beliefs. So they're reflective of the person's true self, however we construct this true self. And in this case, threats to autonomy might, for example, be if people are manipulated or if they're being addicted to certain substances or if they're being deceived into holding, uh, into holding beliefs they otherwise wouldn't. Now, a very different way, but related way of reading the statement about human autonomy is to focus on the fact that people will actually need to be able to execute the decisions they have taken. So that they have the effective capacity to ac execute these decisions. And in this case, we're, we're focusing a lot on freedom on, and opportunities of people to do certain things. So this means, for example, um, coercion would be considered as, as detrimental to autonomy, compulsion. But also, um, if there is a lack of opportunities, we might also say this is detrimental to people's, um, um, to people's autonomy. So with this slide, I just want to show that there are really two different ways in which we can understand here human autonomy. And we see this also a lot in, in the discussion on autonomy in the, uh, in the governance of AI or in the ethics of AI. Very often people are actually talking past each other because they might be focused on very different aspects of human autonomy. And um, here just characterizing as external, internal and external brings a bit more structure into, into the debate. What is so important about autonomy? Now, within philosophy, autonomy really is considered one of the most central values, one of our core values. And I really like this quote by John Chrisman in The Politics of People, where he writes, virtually any appraisal of a person's welfare, integrity, or moral status, as well as the moral and political theories built on such appraisals, will rely crucially on the presumption that her preferences and values are in some important sense her own. So autonomy really plays a central role for a lot of our moral theories and for a lot of our political theories. And it's also a central concept to the notions of responsibility, uh, of, to notions of agency, and even de democracy requires, uh, requires individuals to, to display a certain degree of autonomy. So it's a very fundamental value in theory, but also in practice, autonomy plays a crucial role for our well-being. So there's a lot of research on autonomy in psychology. And there are also multiple studies that have linked perceived autonomy with psychological well-being, uh, with, uh, with intrinsic motivation and uh, to perform various tasks and even with creativity. And I think uh, to see how autonomy is valued in practice, one just needs to consider the Brexit slogan. I mean, the, the, the idea of take back control was really appealing to people's autonomy, to people's, uh, to people's um, desire to be self-governing and not be governed by some, what was construed as an external, uh, external force, the European Union. So, Autonomy really plays a, plays a central role, not only for our well-being, but also for a lot of our moral and political activities. So what does AI have to do with all this? 
So it turns out that AI may pose risks to the internal dimension of autonomy. So this was the, the dimension that appeals to the authenticities of, of our value and values and desires. And, um, and it also it also poses risks to the external dimension of human. And I'd like to I'd like to illustrate these um, by giving a few examples of how we might think that AI could actually affect our our autonomy. So the first one is uh, Facebook's emotional contagion experiment. So this um, in this experiment. Some researchers tinkered with the news feeds of about 700,000 Facebook users to show them either predominantly happy or uh, positive content or predominantly negative content and or angry content. And the researchers showed that depending on what users saw on their news feed, they, the users themselves would then uh, increasingly uh, share positive content or increasingly uh, post negative content depending on whatever which which of the two they saw in the news in newsfeed so this is a typical act of uh, a case of active manipulation so in this case it was researchers who tinkered with the with the newsfeed of users and manipulated them into uh, experiencing certain emotions or sharing certain emotions, and I want to pay attention. I want I want to I want you to pay attention to the fact that in this case, the AI system really was the tool or the vessel that made it possible to to uh, conduct this large scale, scale manipulation on 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 a big scale. Now, examples of manipulation are many, and I think a lot of Advertisement, for example, is, uh, is a bit borderline. Um, there was also the big Cambridge Analytica incident, which also played on, on manipulation, although here it's very uncertain that it actually had uh, significant effects on, on, on voter behavior. Now, another, another case where AI systems might play a role for human autonomy, which is more controversial, but also very interesting, is in the, in, is, is, in how AI systems might actually shape or influence our preferences. So here in this experiment, researchers show that users adapted their preferences for television shows, depending on whether uh, a recommender system, whether depending on whether they were told that a recommender system had selected them. For them. So for example, they rated shows more positively if they thought a recommendation algorithm had picked the shows out for them. And this is because, important because a lot of our online life is guided by recommendation algorithms that structure our news feeds, that give us video recommendations, or that give us, uh, give us music recommendations. So it's a very well established fact that we might change judgment depending on um, the information we, uh, we receive. But it is a, it is a pretty, a significant finding that we might also adapt our preferences, our the the way we we value things, depending on whether uh, we're depending on what a recommendation algorithm tells us. So, I think an important point is here to to remember that also outside the AI context, there are actually many instances where we adapt our preferences. So for example, a friend of mine might come and recommend a me movie to me and uh, I might adapt my preference accordingly. The problematic aspect here is that the, the sort of preference adaptation in the case of algorithms can work against us um, because, the because it is the company who, uh, the company deploying the algorithm that decides how the recommendation algorithm works and for example, if you have um, an Amazon recommendation algorithm that predominantly uh, pushes for its own products or say Amazon products, then you can see clearly see how there's a difference between the use of a the use of AI and the more traditional the tra more traditional cases of let's say friends recommending or even a salesperson making a recommendation to us. Another very interesting case 
is a case of coercion. And this was discussed by El Mamdi et al. in an article where they were talking about multi-agent reinforcement learning. So for this, consider the following situation. Now we have two self-driving cars on a very narrow country road, so they can't overtake one, one or the other. And they are occupied by the first car is occupied, occupied by Alice and the second by Bob. Now, the cars have learned to go as fast as they can. So they try to arrive at the destination in as little time as possible. The drivers have the possibility of braking if they feel unsafe. And in fact, let's assume that Alice, who is in the first car, actually often makes use of this opportunity or this possibility. And she frequently, frequently brakes because she's worried that um, you know, she's, the car is going uh, in, into a curve to break. Now, the only time that Alice does not break is when Bob, Bob's car is behind her so close that she's more afraid of Bob's car ramming her own car if she breaks than she is about you know taking a curve uh, taking a like, taking curve with more speed than than she would be comfortable with. Now, and here the authors point out the possibility of Bob's cars actually learning to drive very close to Alice's car to scare her into braking into not braking. Sorry, um, because. This is how both cars will actually get to their destination in as short a time as possible. So if the second car drives close enough to the first car in which Alice sits, and Alice is afraid of going, of going too fast, but she's even more afraid that Bob's car crashes into her car, then Alice won't break. And so basically, uh, the, the, the systems, these multi-agent systems, the two cars have effectively coerced Alice into not breaking. Now, I think this is a very interesting example because here the car, it is the cars who are the agents. So in the previous examples, um, in the case of the emotional contagion, for example, uh, it, was, it was always human beings who used AI systems for purposes that we would consider detrimental to human autonomy. In this case, it is actually, uh, it's, it's a design, um, it's due to the design of the system. So it's due to the systems themselves that we see human autonomy undermined because it is the systems who, uh, um, who, who, who coerce Alice into not breaking. Okay, so finally, let me briefly discuss something that often comes up in discussions about AI and human autonomy. And this is the idea that we become ever more dependent on AI systems as we, as, we, um, as we evolve and as we more and more integrate them into our lives, and that we, as a result, lose our autonomy because of that dependence. And here I want to point out that, in fact, independence is not the same as autonomy. So I can be very, I can be very dependent on the support of my friends, for example. I can be dependent on my partner or in my family, but most notions of autonomy in particular quite rightly point out that dependence itself is not enough to say that autonomy is undermined. So we need more than dependence to say that we are, we are not autonomous. And in fact, when we look at other technologies, um, starting from fire and uh, going over to this, say, electricity, um, there is a fair amount of, of dependence on on electricity and on, let's say, fire, and yet we probably would not say that these technologies are undermining our, our autonomy. So independence um, and autonomy are not the same. Dependent, uh, dependence is, uh, is not per se detrimental to human autonomy either. So whether or not, uh, whether or not we consider dependence to be a, a risk to human autonomy really depends on the context. It also depends on whether individuals themselves endorse or reject that dependence on systems. Okay, so I talked a lot about the about the about the risks. Um, so I would just like to briefly summarize that there are two different ways we can 
we can think of AI having in detrimental effects to human autonomy. One of them is by considering them as tools. And this was um, uh, this was the case of the, uh, for example, the emotional contagion experiment that I was showing. Um, and but we can also consider AI systems as agents and think about the uh, think about the the almost the technological side effects of uh, of the design choices that were made in in designing the AI system that could also be detrimental to human autonomy. And these could be manipulation, deception, and coercion in, or in, um, in, in, in either of these two cases. So for example, uh, maybe just to give an example of where you, you could say it is, we could understand the AI system as an, as an agent uh, taking part in a manipulative activity. Uh, think about uh, YouTube recommendation algorithms and think about um, how they try to, uh, to maximize user satisfaction. So in this case, people are, uh, the, the amount of time that people spend on the platform is used as a proxy for user satisfaction. So the algorithm tries to get people to spend as much time on the platform as possible. And it was shown a couple of years ago that one popular way of ensuring that people stay on, on, on the platform is to show them more and more extreme video content. So uh, this means uh, I'm, I'm being gradually led to from, I don't know, a CNN news report to some uh, COVID-19 conspiracy. And here you could say the, the manipulation of the user uh, is really a side effect on how the, on the design cho choice of the algorithm. Um, of the, of the AI system as well. Okay, so I've been talking about, uh, about risks to the internal dimension of human autonomy, such as manipulation, but risks to the external, external dimension of human autonomy, such as coercion. But of course, there is the other side of the, of the coin. There are also cases where AI systems clearly, uh, clearly support human autonomy in both the internal and the external uh, aspects. So for example, when AI systems are used to uh, support decision making, they really understand them as helping us to, uh, I mean, in the best case scenario, they help us to make better decisions. And this becomes particularly evident in the healthcare sector, where AI systems really can improve our, our cognitive abilities to make uh, and, and, and help us make better uh, decisions as a result of improved diagnostic tools, for example. They can help us to, uh, to detect pattern. And here, uh, there are countless applications where uh, a AI systems, are just pattern detection helps us to, to improve our own decision making, a lot of them in the business context, for example. They can also help us to identify bias. Now, um, we've just heard in Sandra's talk that bias itself is like a very grave problem with AI systems, but they can also be used to, to, uh, to show us when our decisions have been, have been biased, which in turn, again, helps us to just make better informed decisions. They can also be very supportive of the external dimension of uh, human autonomy by creating new opportunities. So Stephen Hawking's language software, for example, was AI driven. And I think it's, uh, it's not controversial to say that it just opened up entirely new possibilities for him in terms of communication and living his life according to his own, uh, his own values and his own, his, his making decisions, executing decisions more effectively. Autonomous wheelchairs, for example, are also a case where you, where you can assume that they increase people's autonomy tremendously. Autonomous cars might also open up new opportunities through increased mobility. Finally, there is a, also an argument to be made about how, uh, how, how sourcing out uh, menial tasks to AI systems might open up more time for activities that, are, that we consider important for our lives. And again, you could say that this is supportive of this external dimension of human autonomy. So what this shows is that autonomy really is a double-edged sword. And the crux really is to 
identify the instances and the properties in which we consider AI systems to either promote human autonomy or to be detrimental to human autonomy. And in many cases, we also, uh, we also need to weigh up trade-offs between different aspects of autonomy and between autonomy and other values. So for example, uh, safety. And I'm saying this because consider again, the example I gave earlier about the uh, adaptive preference formation. And let's say you're very uncomfortable with the idea that uh, the fact on how your recommendation algorithm selects products for you uh, might affect your own preferences for the products. Now, in, in, in today's internet, we really rely crucially on recommendation algorithms. There's going, to just, I'm just thinking of, for example, for example, Amazon. I mean, without Amazon's recommendation algorithm, I'd be completely lost with the millions of products that I'm being confronted to. I mean, there, the, there, is a, there, is a, there is something very useful about recommendation algorithms. So it's also the question about how, about how we deal with these trade-offs, whether we are happy to accept uh, accept certain trade-offs or whether we are not happy with this. And similarly, uh, we have to weigh up trade-offs between autonomy and other values. And here, uh, the most obvious example that comes to mind are autonomous vehicles. So how many, how much freedom are we given to choose, let's say, speed or risky driving when we are the, when we are sitting in an autonomous vehicle and how much, uh, how much decision-making power is taken from us by having the autonomous vehicle decide on what is considered safe uh, or risk-free behavior. Okay, so finally, to, to tackle these issues, uh, we really need a hybrid approach to, the, to human autonomy. So one of the important things is that we need to work more on the conceptual foundations. So we need to be able to identify which cases, what we take human autonomy to be and uh, which cases we consider to be threatening to human autonomy. And these conceptual foundations need to be supported by empirical foundations. Now here again, um, I'm, I'm thinking of psychology and cognitive science and sociology. Currently there is surprisingly little work on the effects of AI on human autonomy. There's a lot of work on online manipulation, but there's not so much work on other, uh, on other dimensions of human autonomy and also how people perceive their autonomy um, be affected by AI systems. So we really need more research in this direction. Finally, um, very important, there need to be technical solutions. So computer science and engineering, um, are, are two of the disciplines that really can contribute to, uh, to the promotion of human autonomy. And then last but certainly not least, we need, to, we need to just improve our governance of AI systems. So we need to start with an approach to governance that is, uh, that is regulation, but not just regulation, but that also takes into account governance efforts from other st stakeholders. So we really need to develop a governance framework that is built on a shared responsibility about, uh, about, about the impacts of AI on, uh, on society more broadly. And so thank you very much for your attention. I'm looking forward to the questions. Thank you so much, Karina, for an absolutely fascinating talk. And I already see that we have a number of really interesting and nuanced questions coming in from the audience. Before I go to audience questions and my own questions, because I have a few, I'd like to give um, both of you a chance, if you would like, um, to give any reflections that you might want on each other's talks. So, um, Sandra, Karina, if you have any questions of your own or any responses to issues that have come up in um, the other's talk, now would be a really great time. Thank you. Yeah, for me, I think um, what Karina's presentation showed is that we really, really need to, to break down the silos. And the more we don't talk to each other, um, the more we are at risk that we're actually um, making things worse. From a legal perspective, for me, it's very clear, like the ideal law, for example, always has um, a very strong philosophical theory underlying it. 
Um, but very often we forget that actually. Um, so we start to regulate, you know, autonomy, or we start to regulate what dignity means without actually fully understanding the concepts and where they came from. Um, and we fall into the risk of doing box ticking exercises without fully appreciating what the value of autonomy actually is. And I think this is why it's so important that we collaborate together, um, really understanding that the law ought to be informed by good, strong philosophical theory, and that both lawyers and philosophers really need to talk to um, tech people, because when they make design choices, their choices affect people, affect people's lives, uh, ranging from whether they get hit by a car, whether they get credit, are allowed to go to university, and information and theory from a legal and graphic perspective is very important. That should actually guide the whole design process. And in the same way, we as you know, ethicists and as lawyers need to understand how the tech work because when we are thinking about what ought to be society from a philosophical perspective, but from a legal perspective, how we should regulate something, understanding how the tech works is actually very important because otherwise you start barking up the wrong tree, regulating something that doesn't actually do the trick. So I think her presentation just showed that we really actually I don't want to say this, but need to go back to the basis and think about why we actually have to care about autonomy and dignity and how it's being impacted by technology because we are, need to be broader rather than zooming in on details. Yeah, thank you. So, so actually, Sandra, I have a question for you. So in your talk about fairness, you were, you were showing the differences between how fairness is understood in the technical context and how it's usually understood in the legal context. And in fact, you were also showing how um, you know how the the how the legal context really can contribute to this uh, to the technical debate on fairness. So I'm curious to I'm curious to see whether there was also it's also the di reverse direction. So do you was there something where you thought the technical debate on fairness really um, really contributed to the legal debate on the on the issue, or really brought you new insights about fairness uh, in the legal context? Yes, it did. I think every time I work with that team, that happens. We have worked together in the past on explainability issues. Um, and now we've worked together on fairness issues. And I think um, the rewarding and challenging experience was to learn that we are using the same words because Chris uses fairness and Brent uses fairness and I use fairness. And I think a month into writing that paper, we realized that we're talking past each other quite heavily. <laughs> um, and actually learning that we actually have very different starting points, um, yeah, was, was very important. From a tech perspective, I actually also felt that what I haven't really thought about, that tech could also help to be the law better in a certain way, because very often we rely on intuition, for example, to judge if something is unfair, we use our gut feeling for something. I'm telling you a story. I'm not giving you the job because of your um, sexual orientation. Your gut will tell you that's not fair, right? But now that we have very um, untraditional data sources to make decisions, that gut feeling might not actually lead you somewhere anymore. And there it was really important to engage with the tech community and their tech tests because they can actually tell me whether I'm discriminating against people without being aware because my intuition actually leaves me behind. So traditionally as a lawyer I would have said, oh, we, we know discrimination and we know discrimination law. We have done this for centuries. But actually, as the technology has evolved, what I've learned is that we actually need to learn um, a lot from, from tech as well to make sure that people do not fall the, through the cracks. So I have learned a great deal, again, by working with people that are nothing like me. Wonderful. Uh, so I'd like to get to a couple of these questions because I think they're very good questions. And the first of these is um, for Sandra. And um, the question asks, is it fair to say that the start point of this legal moral approach, and here I think we mean the sort of bias transforming approach, is the assumption that a society out with the law is static rather than dynamic, so legal inaction means continuation of the status quo. So I guess what's being asked is, if the law does nothing, will the status quo just persist? Will nothing change? And I guess a, a sort of more meta version of this is, what do you see as the 
the role and the limitations of the law as a process in addressing um, these issues of inequality? Um, where should the law intervene and where should the law step back and let society sort of you know, evolve on its own? Yes, um, very good question. Um, that is one of the troubles, right? That, I wouldn't say troubles, okay. That's one of the, the characteristics of, of fairness and justice that the definition of it is changing. A lot of things that we think are fair right now have been completely unfair in the past and vice versa. So we are completely changing. And whatever will be in the future is something, you know, our concepts of fairness will just change. And trying to have a concept, a static concept is not possible and it's also not desirable. Just imagine we would have stopped um, becoming fairer people and more equal, equal society. Um, I think that's like the, uh, the, the, the strength of a, of a great society is to keep on evolving and, 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 and changing over time. The unfortunate thing is that the, the tech doesn't really care about this. Um, tech likes ones and zeros and black and white and doesn't really care so much about the gray area and the fuzzy concepts in between. So actually having more dialogue around that to say, well, we need to start thinking about design choices that actually support diversity and support changing systems is the right way forward because at the moment, and that's understandable, tech people are quite frustrated because a lawyer cannot give them a definite answer of this is fair and this will always be fair because it changes and it depends on the circumstances and something that is fair in this context might be completely unfair in another one. So the change is actually a feature and not really a buck. So um, basically the law wants to be agile and wants to give us the opportunity to reflect on what's right, what's fair right now and allow us flexibility moving forward and the tech just needs to um, acknowledge that. Uh, from a legal perspective, yes, I think the law has a very important role to play in the sense that I'm tremendously happy and proud that we have non-discrimination law and that it's hard law and that it's strictly enforceable if you break it. Um, of course, there are limits there because not, not, no law is ever per perfect. The law can never be perfect, but it's a very, very good step forward to make sure that certain people are being protected. The limit of the law is that very often... Um, a change in the law doesn't necessarily lead to a change in mindset. So just because I say discrimination based on certain characteristics like gender or ethnicity, ability are illegal, doesn't mean that you change people's mind automatically, right? They might not even see that they are being biased or they think that their bias is just a conviction and is actually absolutely justified. So the limits of the law is that I cannot change your mind if you have a strong conviction either way. And I think that's probably where we as a society have still some work to do and some awareness raising to just show people how different realities are and really you know, um, introduce people to inequalities in the world and make them aware um, that the world is not a fair place for everybody and then teach them or encourage them to have empathy in a certain way and try to figure out what they can do to play a part in that because you you can't a law will never um make you want to change um it's actually probably the community and the, the the desire to be part of something that makes you change and you see you know, others as part of your community, then you actually want them to be better off than they used to be. And I think that's what the law cannot do, but this is what we as a society can do. Thank you. And of course, I mean, I'm not a lawyer, but I believe it is the case that sometimes the law and the courts have been substantially ahead of popular opinion on some issues. So I believe um, issues like interracial marriage in the US and I thought it was notable a couple of years ago, um, Ireland um, legalized gay marriage by popular vote. And it was one of the first countries, maybe the first country in the world to do so by popular vote. It was quite late in terms of legalizing gay marriage because this had been legalized by um, uh, law and the courts uh, much earlier in other contexts. Yeah. So it certainly is the case that sometimes, you know, the law will come to a different conclusion than um, the kind of popular opinion would be at that time. Definitely. Uh, I'll switch to a question for Karina. So you raised the issue of kind of the philosophical perspective um, on autonomy and also the psychological perspective, um, how much it matters for well-being. Um, a question raised is 
when thinking about autonomy from AI influences, should we focus primarily on the experience of autonomy? Or is this a concern about the deeper subconscious influences of technology on our self-image and worldviews? You know, if we believe that we are autonomous, even if we aren't really, is that enough? Or do we need to be concerned about the fact that we may believe we're autonomous while actually, you know, living our life on a train track that is set out in ways that we don't even understand? Yeah, that's, an, that's, a, that's a really excellent question. And it really goes to the heart of um, what is at stake here. I think, um, I think both dimensions are really important here. I think perceived autonomy is very important for a number of uh, for a number of reasons, because our perceived autonomy, at least to some extent, tracks how, whether we are autonomous. Um, sorry, whether we are acting autonomously. So I guess there is there is a distinction to be made between uh, global autonomy, so the idea that I am an autonomous person, and um, and local autonomy, the idea that I, uh, I I can act autonomously in a certain in, in instance or in a certain context. So for example. I might be um, I might be a smoker, and so maybe my actions regarding smoke and smoking are not autonomous. But I am autonomous as a person as a whole. Apart from that, I, I'm, I'm I consider myself autonomous. So now going back between this uh, to this distinction uh, between the perceived autonomy and what one might call actual autonomy, uh, it is very difficult because to some extent. Um, I mean, it, it depends. It's very sensitive to to the notion of autonomy that we are using. So the uh, there are different approaches to how one might define autonomy. So some of them are substantive in a sense that they uh, they bake the they bake certain values into into the notion of autonomy. So for example, there are there are conceptions of autonomy that would say the will to be enslaved would never be an autonomous will. It would be somehow imposed on us by a certain cultural context or social context, for example. So, but the will to be enslaved can never be an autonomous um, desire. Whereas other accounts would say, no, no, if you have reflected on your, on your, uh, your will to be uh, enslaved, and if you have respect, if you reflected on your social context and on your cultural context, and you still you still feel certain that you want to be enslaved, then that would count as an autonomous decision. And this points to the fact that in fact, we can never really separate ourselves from our cultural context. So it's very difficult to say whether, um, I mean, Femin the, 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 the recent literature on feminist philosophy picks up very strongly on this relational component of autonomy. We are embedded in a social context. We are embedded in a cultural context. And we can't really separate ourselves as individuals, on, as individuals from this cultural context. So as a society, we might well be on a certain track where um, people, let's say, 300 years ago might have thought, oh, you know, and you know, I would never want to live like this. It would be detrimental to, to my autonomy or to our autonomy. Uh, whereas uh, nowadays it would seem completely, completely coherent and we'd say we'd, we're still autonomous people. So in this sense, I'm coming back now to this distinction between the psychological and the philosophical component. There is an, there is an, um, there is an important sense in which the psychological component tracks the philosophical value of autonomy. But I think we also need to go further. We need also need to abstract away from the psychological component and reflect, take the bigger picture and reflect on how and where as a society do we want to stand and how are the practices actually compatible with our with our with the values we hold in our society. Thank you. Uh, building on that, um, a question that I had for myself was well, I often find myself when thinking about um, issues on the ethics and societal impacts of AI, I find myself asking, how big is this really going to be? How different is it from the situation we're already in? And Karina, you talked a little earlier about um, sort of external impacts on autonomy and internal impacts on autonomy, where external might be, um, you know, laws forbidding us to do things. And there are plenty of things that I might want to do that 
only affect me that I'm not allowed to, I have to wear a seatbelt, I'm not allowed to take psychedelic drugs, um, and so on. And internally, I feel like I am probably, as you pointed out, shaped by my society and culture in all sorts of different ways. Like everything around me tells me what the good life is and what a you know, model of a good citizen is uh, when it is an appropriate time to get up and to go to bed, um, what a healthy uh, lifestyle and diet is. I imagine that I don't have nearly as much internal autonomy as I believe I do because so much of my frame of reference is shaped by these things around me. So I guess my question is how different, like, how much of an X factor is throwing AI into this? given that there are already all of these systems that shape and impinge upon our autonomy. Is there something really scary different here or is it you know, a subtle um, evolution of the kinds of pressures that already exist in our autonomy? Yeah, so um, I mean, this points to this, this embeddedness in the culture and uh, as you just said, uh, points to these different takes on autonomy and I would very much consider, I would very much think that we must have a notion, we must adopt a notion of autonomy that is compatible with the fact that we are embedded in this cultural context that tells us um, about, you know, what the good life is. We have internalized a lot of the, a lot of uh, our what, cultural views and values and um, our social context as well. So I think so first, maybe I'd like to I'd like to push back and think you can still consider yourself as an autonomous being. You can still act autonomously, even if you are in a in even if you ha are influenced by your cultural surroundings. And I think that's actually necessary um, necessary I mean, to take this into account, to take this rela relational aspect of autonomy into account when constructing it. Now, in terms of how much of a how big of a deal AI is. Um, I think I think it is going to be a very big deal because there is this, uh, in a sense, almost this centralized notion to a lot of to a lot of AI systems. We have the big tech companies who are deploying a lot of the a lot of the algorithms. So now we have uh, we have actors who have an enormous amount of influence on the rest of the population. So that's very different from being embedded, embedded in this cultural ecosystem that we are living in, where norms and values develop, but they develop in different places. They, uh, they, might, be, they might be exchanged and we settle on certain, on certain values and certain norms. So uh, in terms of how much, how big of a deal AI is, I think it is a pretty big deal, if not qualitatively, then at least quantitatively, because there is, uh, because AI systems are deployed on such a such a wide scale, and because the power is so concentrated to individual actors. Thank you. So I'd like to come back to a question that I thought was interesting, uh, relating to Sandra's talk. Um, your talk mainly focused on making the argument for, uh, well, as I understood it, um, the need for more bias transformational approaches in a lot of domains. Are there areas where it is appropriate to use a bias preserving metric? And what are those areas and what are the kind of criteria where you'd want to um, kind of stick to that metric? Yes, um, definitely. The, um, there is definitely a, a place for, for bias preservation. So if you're just interested in diagnostics or testing and you're actually not making decisions about people, then you can use whatever bias metrics you want to use. And actually I would encourage everybody to test as much as possible because um, intent is not necessary in order to be liable. So even if you have the best intentions of not being discriminatory, if you are, um, you're gonna be liable. So testing as much as, as possible. Um, bias preservation is only a problem if we're not happy how we made decisions in the past. If we're actually happy with we made decisions in the past, then you can use bias preservation. So if you actually have either fairness or ground truth, um, when you actually, for example, have a diverse data set, you know, um, healthcare could be something. So if you had, for example, um, 
um, health data is prone to gender bias in itself, which is a problem, but to actually have a diverse data set that takes, um, for example, gender into consideration and there are no, um, it's actually curated enough and it's complete, um, then you can use it. So the, the rule of thumb would be if you're happy with what you're doing, then you can use it as a starting point to make decisions because then you're just automating um, something that a human used to do and deferring that to an algorithm. Or if you're not actually having an impact on, on, on people, then it's fine too. And if you find yourself in a situation where the jurisdiction that you're operating under is fine with formal equality. It's just fine by not taking um, differences between groups into consideration, which might be the case. Like I'm only talking about Europe here, so we have to be very careful to, to say that. So yeah, rule of thumb, if you're happy with what you're doing and or you're not um, making consequence decision for people, then you can use bias preservation. I guess who you are matters in that. Yes, definitely, yes. Um, it's, it's hard to, because you would actually need to reverse the burden of to prove and say, you have to prove to me that there is no bias, um, which is much harder um, to say, because, you know, most people will say there is always some sort of inequality, um, even we might not be aware of it. Sometimes I find it interesting to do the thought experiment. What if we had systems that were able to act on this kind of data and it was 150 years ago or something? And um, for example, I think that wouldn't work out too well for Irish people, um, typically thought of as a less lazy, lazy, less intelligent, and the data would probably show that they weren't in such, you know, good positions. Obviously, yeah. attitudes to that have changed, um, same with and Black people and so on. I often think that it's, it can be a little bit difficult to see the wood for the trees when you're within a societal context and structure, but sometimes when you kind of see that this is a snapshot, it's inevitable that there are going to be um, biases that haven't been weeded out yet. If, and if you think about what happened if we were introducing these elements at a different point in history, um, for example, when women's rights were nowhere near as advanced and the data reflected that in every societal structure, it would feel a lot more apparent that um, just going on the data was not going to capture everything. Yes, definitely. This is also why I think, again, to come back to why breaking the silos is so important, is because the data doesn't actually tell you about the story, right? The, the, um, the data doesn't tell you about the, the inequalities that the Irish had to endure, it doesn't tell you about the inequalities that um, people of color and women had to endure, or people um, <clears throat> people with disabilities, or, or people, uh, or what, what, what restriction had to normativity post on people. Like, the data doesn't tell you. The data only tells you those people didn't get to go to university, and you assume that that was probably a reason as to why that happened. And therefore it's so important to actually ask about the reasons and what are the reasons why somebody didn't get a loan because there might be a racial and a gender bias to it, which was very often the case or why they weren't admitted to university, right? So this is one of the reasons why I'm trying to argue that the burden of proof actually needs to be reversed. Um, that if you want to use bias preservation, then you have to prove to me that what you're doing is fair, like that the data set that you're using is representing fairness among groups. And that's a challenging task. And then if you do that, what I want that this is being made public so that other people can come up and say, you haven't thought about the struggles of Irish people, for example, or you haven't thought about the struggles of gay people in the past. Um, and this could be because you're not aware of it, but making the assumptions public and making the decisions public that you're making actually allows people to comment on it and investigate it. And that's the only way how you can actually change a decision-making structure. If you say, what are you doing is actually entrenching inequality even further. If you use this instead, it would actually, you know, um, bring equal access to certain groups. Karina, you have a, a question or a point on this. Yeah, I was just, just thinking about what you were saying, Sandra, and. I wonder what your opinion is about the use of algorithms in court. So just thinking of the, you know, by now very famous example of algorithms that are used to predict recidivism. So whether how likely a certain defendant is uh, is to reoffend. Um, and here we really have a clash between what you're promoting as uh, you know, fairness or what we, we should be trying to achieve, uh, taking into account um, you know, previous discrimination and, and the, well, the accuracy of the, of the algorithm to, uh, to 
predict recidivism. So I think the accuracy of these algorithms is pretty bad in general, but let us assume that now we actually had a very decent algorithm that was uh, quite likely to uh, predict recidivism rate. And uh, it turned out because uh, uh, there is a correlation between, um, I guess, uh, poverty and, uh, and race in, let's say, in the United States, that in fact, uh, black people are more likely to reoffend. And so the algorithm would, uh, would uh, in turn have more, uh, in, would in turn have this problem about um, unequal false positives and false negatives in the case of black and white defendants. But here, I think it would be very difficult to sell to the, let's say to the American population that now we have to take into account these historical, um, these historical, historical discrimination. So what is your, what is your take on, on the use of unfairness in court algorithms? I think, I guess that's, uh, that's um, yeah, I think that's a very good question. I think it's also one of the, the areas where we're very aware that racial bias is very predominant. Um, the problem with accuracy is like twofold. You know, if you're trying to assess whether somebody uh, will reoffend, you often look at how often they have been, you know, arrested in the past, um, uh, how high their sentences were in the past, for example. Um, then you can say, well, this person has done so many crimes in the past, so it's very likely that they go do something similar. What you have to question is, um, why those people were charged. And if you look at the statistics, that is eight times more likely that they're gonna be searched, um, searched and stopped if you're black than you're white. And it's more likely that you get convicted when you're black than white. And it's more likely to get a higher sentence when you're black than white. Then you have to question of whether accuracy is still in the debate because the data that goes in there is not unbiased. What you're absolutely right is to say that life is tougher for people of color, and we have to acknowledge that, right? It's definitely the, the case if, you know, crimes of poverty, are gender and, and racially biased, obviously. But that is the question, what do you do with that? I argue for substantive equality. Formal equality would mean, well, you know, if you're more likely to convict, commit a crime, I don't care about the circumstances, that it's harder to be black and therefore you go to prison. I'm in favor of substantive equality, which is that life is harder for you because we made it harder for you. So now we have to find a way how we can make life easier for you. So that doesn't mean to put you back into prison, um, put you in a seclude you from society, but actually figure out what can we do to steer the path so you can, for example, find a job, right? What can we do for rehabilitation? What can we do to make sure that you are in um, the right circles and get back on the right path, right? That's a, there's a soft tool that you can do. So it's very important that we get away from you go to prison or you're being sent free, but there is something in between that allows you to be flexible to address the underlying problem, which is that people of color and women have it harder in society. And it actually takes an active approach to make sure that we're not um, getting caught in that vicious circle. Yeah, that's interesting because I guess with women in these court decisions, it's exactly the opposite, right? Women are um, tend to, to re-offend less or are less likely to re-offend than men. So would that change anything in your argument about, I mean, treating men and women equally in, in court? Sorry, one more time. Or the algorithm? So currently, I mean, there is a huge gender difference between uh, between men reoffending and women reoffending. Yeah. Um, should we not should we not not say, well, you know, we have to take this into account as well? Well, again, it depends. I, I, in the same way that I would say that race plays a role, maybe gender plays a role, but we have to be very careful what the assumptions are there, right? Um, very often we take a shortcut and say black people reoffend more often, meaning black people are more criminal. It's like, no, this is not a, it's not a biological thing, right? There's a social yeah. structure that forced them into situation. And it might be the case that men are more likely to reoffend because the social structures are putting them in a situation to reoffend more often, or something else is happening on a gender basis that makes women less often to reoffend. So you need to find out what the reasons are. Um, and again, why it's so important to break the silos and bring social sciences back in and have people from queer studies, racial, um, critical race theory, gender um, theorists on board that can explain to us what the differences are and then find a solution to make sure that 
nobody reoffends in the end, right? And figure out what makes people act in a certain way. Um, so yeah, saying goodbye to the binary, as hard as it is, and something the tech doesn't really want us to do, will be super important to figure out what's actually going on inside people's heads and in, in their environment and in their lives. And presumably some of these issues of um, bias and data also apply to the um, victim side of this. Now, again, I'm not an expert in this, but I believe it's the case that um, women experience higher incidence of um, rape. Um, they are less likely to report it. Um, cases are reported are less likely to go to trial and they're less likely to be um, convicted, or at least as a fraction. Um, the fact that they actually go to conviction are very small compared to the overall number. And yeah. if you had a decision support system that said, well, you know, every hundred of these that is reported only like 10 of them actually go to conviction. Therefore it's 90% likely that this is like not a crime. You yes. would be um, sort of embedding a um, kind of a fundamental systemic inequality as I see it. Absolutely, yes. That's one of the examples that we mentioned in the paper that we have to be very careful if we actually have information about ground truth because you said, um, uh, hate crimes and, and, and sexual violence, particularly against LGBTQ members and, and women, is extremely prevalent, but very often we don't have the data because people are not um, able to come forward because, you know, for, for obvious reasons, or the legal remedies are actually not very good or um, the, whatever evidence you need to bring that something like that happened deters you from doing that or the social cost of bringing a case. So you don't have that data. So the ground truth is there is no violence, but we know it's not true. So training an algorithm of that without actually, you know, not taking this into consideration, you are starting to hurt people. And that's very important to say that the status quo and the data that we have doesn't reflect ground truth. Um, and you have that basically for, for everything. You have it in healthcare as well, where a lot of the data is being used to train um, medical algorithms is on male patient data because it's cheaper. Right? because women have more complicated biologies, so it's cheaper to train it on male data. But then obviously that's not ground truth either. And we have very inaccurate, for example, drug dosages for women or people of color because their biology is different, right? It's really um, taking that into consideration is really important and not just assume um, that we have ground truth and challenging the idea of ground truth. I saw recently a case of a medical system that had been, that turned out to be a lot more accurate for men than for women. And it turned out that it had been trained on a database of army veterans because they had uh, a lot of data on army veterans and could use yeah. it, but um, the army is more male than female. And so they, yeah. you know, the database was 94% male and 6% female or something. And lo and behold, the medical system worked a lot better for the men. Yes, that, that's the problem. Like very often it's a, it's a, it's a money choice. Um, to, to do that. Um, other reasons is because, you know, uh, it's more risky to use female patient data or use female patients for, for clinical trials because they might get pregnant, right? And then you have that risk there. So it's just cheaper to do that. Hormones fluction across the, the menstrual cycle over women. So it's not as static as men. It's men patient data is easier and cheaper, if that makes sense, right? And very often you don't have the, you don't, you don't want to say you don't have the resources, but you would like to say you don't have the resources to actually have a diverse data set. Um, and then you, as you said, then you take, take data that is available and cheaply, and that's from old veterans. And then obviously a lot of people just fall through the cracks. I mean, already, already it's male mice on which uh, these things are uh, developed. So it's not only in the patient context or clinical trials, it's also before, I mean, most of the mice are actually male. Yeah, absolutely. Are, even there, gender bias everywhere. <laughs> We're coming to our last 10 minutes. This is a fascinating discussion and I would love to speak to you about these issues all day long. I've got one more audience question, which I thought was a very good one um, for Karina that I'd like to get to, and then a closing question of my own. So the um, audience question was relating to the um, example of autonomy and self-driving cars that you gave um, earlier on, Karina. And um, the audience uh, uh, question asks, in the case of Alice and Bob, so our drivers in our car, what is the bar that separates coercion from influence? Is it just that any influence sufficient to change that individual's decision is coercive? Or is there some sort of objective standard? For example, if Alice feels unable to slow down on a corner when Bob's car is 20 meters behind her, is that still systemic coercion? 
Yeah, very, very good question. I think in general, the distinction between influence, coercion and manipulation are very subtle. I think maybe even more so between influence and, and manipulation. I mean, when does something and influence become manipulative and when is it uh, when is it not? So in the case of coercion, I think in this case, we have a, we have the case that Alice clearly doesn't want to, uh, wants to break, but she's prevented from breaking by, um, by the autonomous, uh, by, by the, the AV behind her. So um, this is, influence could all, could, is a much more general notion. Maybe coercion is some kind of influence. Maybe coercion is coercive influence in that uh, Alex would have, would have preferred to not to, but um, is made to do instead. So she would have preferred to, uh, to, to, to break and she's made to not break in this case. Um, influence, I think, is a much wider wider notion, and we just really need to distinguish between different different kinds of influence, like coercive influence, manipulative influence. Um, there could be just influence through, uh, let's say, rational um, um, through, through through arguments, rational arguments. In this case, you would say um, somebody gives me a rational argument for um, for buying a washing machine um, then and I buy the washing machine that's uh, that doesn't seem to me manipulative if somebody shows me a picture of a washing machine and and our happy people and friends and you know really speaking to my emotions then that might be a manipulative inference somebody says um, buy this washing machine or uh, I kill your partner then that would be a coer coercive influence so I think we really have to distinguish between Different, uh, different types of influences. And the distinction is not always clear cut. So often we know it when we see it, but actually making this distinction precise is incredibly challenging um, and is the topic of a lot of philosophical and I guess also legal discussion. Thank you. Okay, well, in this that case, I'm going to and close it with my last question, and then I will let you both go and enjoy your Saturdays. And thank you so much for taking the time out for these talks. They've been absolutely fascinating for me, and I hope for um, the audience who are um, taking part as well. And thank you to everyone who's um, provided questions. These have been really great, um, very nuanced and complex questions that I think have brought out a lot of really interesting thinking. My last question comes back to this issue of smashing the silos. So, Sandra, you're a lawyer by background who's moved into this area, and Karina, you're working in academic philosophy. Both these disciplines have the reputation of sometimes being quite traditional in terms of the expectations of people working within these disciplines. Um, there aren't always easy opportunities to do interdisciplinary work, and sometimes for career progression within academia, one is expected to do work that conforms to a particular expectation in terms of building on um, historical work. It's not always easy to do work like this that I'm convinced as clear to you are, is of the utmost importance. What advice would you have for um, early career researchers and undergraduates who really want to kind of study the law or study philosophy or other disciplines and bring their expertise to bear on these things? Um, should I, who want you to start? Feel free to start, Sandra. Okay, yes. Yes, oh my God, it's such an important and very difficult question. And I, I have to start by saying that I don't have a perfect answer because you're absolutely right. Um, from my personal perspective, like law is a traditional uh, field. Um, and very often in multiple disciplines, you're encouraged to actually stay within your, within your silo. Um, I think it will be very important actually for all to take an active role in that to making it easier uh, for early career researchers, especially um, because once you're tenured, probably that doesn't really matter anymore, but on the, on, on the way up, basically um, making sure that those people have the opportunity to work with other people. One of the things that are very good is um, to be, to work in an environment where this is encouraged. One of the reasons why I'm at OII, for example, is because um, there are so many different disciplines working together. So working with people that are nothing like you is the, the, the cornerstone of that department. And I see that this is um, why it has been around for like 15, 15 years now. 
um, was one of the first ones that actually encouraged that. But you can see that now uh, a lot of other disciplines are opening the doors as well. So I think now going forward, it will be easier to find institutions that actually encourage that. Similarly, once people are in a situation where they have more control over where they publish, looking at journals that focus on interdisciplinary work is the next hurdle. Very often law journals, for example, don't necessarily want tech views on it or, or philosophical views on it. So the ones, the next generation, basically, that has the ability to steer the editorial board and, and, and steer the scope of, of journals have the responsibility, I think, to create venues where people can actually publish. And then obviously people who make career choices need to understand how important it is to understand about the tech. I think, for example, we have a duty as legal scholars to advocate our students very early on about the tech component of law. I think it's very unlikely that as a, um, if you're practicing law, either as a judge or in a company or if you're in private practice, whatever, that you're not going to have some touch point with technology, right? It's going to be there. So if it's going to be part of your life, then you should be encouraged to study it and work in it. So I think we're getting to that point where I think um, people are starting to realize that it's really important to, to rip down the silos, but I think there's still some, some way to go. And I think every, everybody in a position of, of power needs to push in the direction to steer the path for early career searches to make it easier to break out of traditional silos. Thank you, that's a wonderful answer and a lot of really good things to build on in that. Karina. Yes, so um, so I, I definitely back up what Sandra was saying for early career researchers. Maybe uh, maybe I say some words to choices by undergraduate students. So um, I'm, I'm a very good example for um, somebody who has been in a silo and tried to break out because I did physics before, before I moved into, into philosophy. Uh, philosophy of physics and then move finally into into AI ethics. So I found it very hard to uh, to uh, to do interdisciplinary work within my discipline and actually had to change uh, disciplines in order to be able to to do so. Now I think as an undergraduate in in, in Oxford, philosophy already has follows this tradition of having another discipline. So there is no philosophy undergraduate. There's just philosophy in, of and physics or uh, and philosophy, computer science and philosophy, PPE. So I think this already goes into the direction of trying to trying to have students that are experts in, in different, uh, that become experts in different disciplines. As an undergraduate, I would still probably um, give the advice of choosing one primary discipline and then save the interdisciplinarity for the masters at the postgraduate stage. Because I think actually it is very important to have solid foundations in one discipline and then start start going out and, and incorporating insights from other disciplines. Because one of the big challenges of interdisciplinarity is trying to, to make it to make it solid and not try not reinventing the wheel. So I think um, good interdisciplinary work requires a solid foundation in one or ideally two disciplines. And I think these solid, solid foundations one gets by doing an undergraduate degree in one discipline. And then as Sandra said, um, start looking to move into interdisciplinary and by research environments afterwards or um, interdisciplinary masters afterwards. Thank you so much. Some really great advice there. And hopefully we have some undergraduates in the audience who can uh, use that advice in their own planning for the future because these issues are not going to go away they're going to become incredibly important over the coming decades and um, Oxford Union members will hopefully be playing a role in shaping that. Um, so it's now my responsibility to close this session. Thank you so much to uh, Professor Sandra Wachter of the Oxford Internet Institute which is doing a lot of the leading work um, in the UK on these issues. Please do check out their website and Sandra's recent paper which builds on her talk and um, Dr. Karina Prunkel, who is um, part of the new um, Institute for Ethics and AI set up in the philosophy faculty in um, Oxford um, last year, and who also, I believe, has a paper um, coming out on exactly um, these issues. We're not done for the day. There is one more session coming up at five o'clock, and I do hope that you'll consider joining us. This one will be um, Jeff Ding from the Future of Humanity Institute and um, Kanta Dihal 
from the Lieberkeim Center for the Future of Intelligence, where I'm based, and they'll be looking at intercultural and um, ethical perspectives on AI, taking a, an international and global perspective. Um, I've been Sean O'Hagerty of the Lieberkeim Center for the Future of Intelligence. We're mainly based in um, Cambridge, but we do have uh, spokes in Oxford, Imperial and Berkeley. And it's been a real pleasure to be able to work together with um, colleagues from some of our leading collaborating centers in Oxford. And at this point, I should hand over to James to um, close out. And I should say thank you to James for giving us the opportunity to participate in the Smashing to Silos series, which is just such an important topic and one that really deserves a platform like the Oxford Unions. Thank Sean, you. thank you very much indeed. I mean, you took all the words out of my mouth there. Thank you to, to everybody else can, participating in this event. And um, it will be going up as soon as we can get it up as well on our uh, YouTube channel, which has, I think, now over 1.25 uh, million people. So hopefully there's some uh, some silos out there that will be smashed as a result of this talk. So thank you all very much indeed. And as Sean says, see you at five o'clock. <laughs>